Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Federica Hanabili. I'm the product specialist in anatomy education at Leader Healthcare Group. We are so grateful for having you today in today's webinar. Uh, we shall tackle about BioLucida for medical education and how to use uh, how to use it to create histology classes from whole slide images. I hope you guys can see me clearly and I hope you can see our PowerPoint presentation. If it all works well, I appreciate if you could just please click a thumbs up on the uh, chat box. Uh, during the webinar, we shall, you, shall, you will be requested to provide answers to a number of questions. And for those who are using uh, dual devices, you can click, you can open the, your um, camera uh, and, and just, just take a picture of the QR codes and it goes directly to dementi.com. Or uh, if you're using a single device, you can then key into your browser, www.menti.com and use the code 3315370 to key in your answers. Okay, so, uh, okay, I think it's all well. So um, before we proceed, there would be a few webinar housekeeping. Today's webinar is scheduled to last up to an hour, including question and answer. This webinar is being recorded for the sole purpose of review material and can be shared to registered participants upon request. And of course, um, uh, comments and questions are welcome during the call. Please use the tools, uh, as you see here on your screen, uh, to post questions, raise hands, or chat with administrators and panelists during the webinar. Okay, I think I have to just uh, reshare again the code. Just a second. So the QR code to menti.com is 33153702. I'm just gonna share the screen. So just to check on um, to where you are calling from, there will be, uh, let's get a bit to know one another with a simple question. Please key in your country you're joining from. So I would, um, just allow me to share the screen. Okay. Okay, so there are a few um, who've answered already from our colleagues and thank you so much for finding your way. And so uh, as we can see here, there are uh, individuals who are joining from Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, oh, US, uh, okay, UAE. Okay, thank you so much for uh, there are, as well from Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Okay, thank you so much for uh, joining us in today's webinar. We really appreciate your your support. Okay, there are a few more who's coming from. Yeah, okay, it's the same. So, of course, uh, the webinar is in collaboration with uh, Leader Healthcare and MBF Bioscience. Just to give an introduction between the two companies. So, Leader Healthcare, um, since 2009, has rapidly grown to become one of the largest and most influential names in healthcare solutions across the Middle East. We are based in Dubai with offices in India and Australia. We have an international approach to distributing only the best medical products and equipment and to train healthcare professionals. Well, for MBF Bioscience, they are a company that develops software and hardware for biomedical research and education with the main offices in Vermont in the United States. The company markets, sells, and supports its products globally from offices on three continents. Okay, so for today, we are super excited to present and enrich your medical education course with BioLucida. It is an interactive learning management software developed to, in collaboration with leading medical educators across the globe. BioLucida then takes the concept of virtual microscopy to the next level by providing educators a collaborative platform to manage, display, annotate, and navigate whole slide images, reaching more students efficiently by delivering dynamic and rich content accessible by hundreds of users simultaneously. 
I am pleased to present our speaker for today, Dr. Nathan O'Connor. He's the product manager from MBF Bioscience. Dr. O'Connor has been successfully researching and introducing technologies into the scientific imaging and analysis market since 1994. Currently, he leads the development of MBF's BioLucida platform for managing, viewing, sharing, and analyzing 2D and 3D slide images over the internet. BioLucida is used in medical education by thousands of students studying histology and histopathology. BioLucida is also used by researchers to organize, publish, and analyze large collections of whole slide images. He is also responsible for MBF's brain maker and neuroinfo technologies that automatically delineate images of experimental brain sections with anatomic regions from Alan Mao's Brain Atlas and its ontology. As the director of Autocant Imaging, Dr. O'Connor led the development and commercialization of what is now the gold standard technology in statistical 3D image restoration software called Auto de Bloor. During his tenure at Molecular Devices in Sunnyvale, California, and throughout a rich consulting experience, he implemented an automated image management and analysis strategies for several laboratories and organizations, enabling them to manage, view, and analyze, um, and succinctly report experimental results for imagery that can populate terabytes of data spread over thousands of files. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome Dr. O'Connor. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks Federico uh, for that nice introduction as well as uh, thanks to Yasmin for getting everything up and running here. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll start with what I would like to talk about. Um, let's do that here, share. And so, Really, um, here, here's an overview of what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, it, it should take me about 30 to 35 minutes, I'm anticipating, so we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, so really, I'll talk about what BioLucida is, uh, and at its heart, it's really a virtual microscopy uh, serving system that lets you customize your slides into classrooms so that you can uh, make uh, the experience of your choosing for your students. Um, I'll talk a bit about how BioLucid is implemented. Um, today, I'll be touching servers that are on Amazon's AWS. We can live there or we can live within your, your institute's IT. Um, it's throughout our install base, I would say it's about 50-50. Some schools like to have us manage everything. Um, other schools like to have their IT department uh, manage things. And for us, we, we could do it either way, um, spinning up um, an AWS instance to run BioLucida on takes maybe an hour. So it's it's really uh, it's a really straightforward thing. Um, so I, and if there are any technical questions on that, feel free to ask. And if I, I don't get to them, um, I, I'm, I'm sure, um, I'm sure Federico and I will work together to make sure we, we answer things. Um, <clears throat> so the nuts and bolts of things, I'm gonna talk about um, creating and managing users. So that's how you, how you make accounts for your educators and your students. Um, and then at the core of this is making really um, collections of slides and sharing them with your students. And so we'll, we'll look at how to do that. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about enriching content a little bit by annotating slides as well as adding tags and, and metadata. Um, and then um, I'll talk a very, very briefly about options if you know um, what to do if you um, are using glass. Um, we do offer slide scanning services, um, and that's something um, I, I, I know uh, Federico can talk to as well. Um, and we also have, um, I'll show near the end, um, we have uh, access to and can point you to a large collection of, of virtual microscope slides. Uh, we work closely with um, an organization called the American Association of Anatomists, um, and they have one of the largest repository of slides from several different schools um, called the Virtual Microscopy Database. Um, and when you become a member of them, um, which has nothing to do with MBF Bioscience, they're an association of, of educators in histology, um, but um, all members have access um, for educational purposes to that large set of slides. So to overview things, um, again, um, I'm gonna talk about making these classrooms or collections, uh, I'll use that word interchangeably of slides. Um, 
You can drag and order your slides, of course, um, into any organization you want. You can rename them um, to have a customized name. That's useful for um, when um, you're testing and you don't want the students to see the exact name of the slide. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can, can display and, and, and rearrange your slides. Um, toward oh and the other thing i would mention is that you can have um you can have the same slide in um in a, in a classroom as many times as you want or across classrooms so that different instructors can use a slide over and over and over you might have different regions highlighted or different um annotations on the slide and by lucida still maintains one slide on the server so you don't the more slides that you, you the more you use your slides, um, you don't build up uh, a uses of, of resources on the server. Uh, that's kind of it's that's what's at the core of the technology uh, at, at its database side. Um, <clears throat> for annotations, we pretty much model things off of PowerPoint. If you can draw in PowerPoint or one of its analogs, you you can make annotations, and I'll go to that in a bit of detail. Um, and then your once your 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 contents there, your students will be able to. Uh, mine the slides that they have permission to. So if they wanted to see all their kidney slides, if they wanted to see all the um, brain slides that they had access to for neuroanatomy um, session, they could do that. The other thing which I, I probably won't get into, but um, some folks do use, so I, I point it out, is that um, we do have the ability for some comparative anatomy. So you can open up multiple slides um, and lock them so that um, here I have a primate uh, coronal brain section and uh, the left side is a nissel stain and the right side is a myelin. And I can lock those so that I can zoom into areas of the slide uh, at the same magnification and the same area of brain. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, viewing capabilities within BioLucida and uh, that's kind of the overview. So why don't we jump right into the software uh, and Federico, if there are any questions, just um, interrupt me um, as I get talking. Um, yes, we are um, checking on the questions uh, from awesome. the chat. Yeah, don't, don't hesitate to, to interrupt me. So this is the BioLucida app that I'm opening. Um, and I'm connected to a particular server, BioLucida.net. I will say everything you see, um, I'm up in uh, northern Vermont, about 20 minutes from the Canadian border on the east coast of the US. And this server, I'll be connecting to two servers, actually. One is in Germany. And the other one is down in North Carolina, which is roughly halfway between me and Miami down in Florida, if, if you can picture that on the East Coast of the US. So um, we have really good luck um, with, with uh, um, sending image slides uh, remotely to, as Federico said, hundreds of students at a time. I think one of our largest schools has about 400 students uh, in their neuro neuroanatomy department in Munich. Um, and they all access slides simultaneously. They actually have focusable slides too. So if you have, if you have slides, um, like I'll show a, a, a cytology example in a minute, um, and, you, and you can actually make it like you're at the microscope by focusing through. Um, but this is the BioLucid app. I'm logged into a particular server. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I'll, I'll point off straight away is that if you see here, the yellow track directories, that's a, a glimpse right into the server where all my slides are. And they can be different servers or they can be on the, on the server of, of interest. Um, typically they are on a, a file share that the service can at, at least has access to with you know, something like 100 megabits per second, uh, a gig is optimal. Um, but if you look here, I just wanna look at the IO virtual slide box that I've got set up here. On my server, it's actually just called the virtual slide box. Uh, and if I click on that and I look at the slides in there, I have a thousand, a thousand slides in this collection, but they're all in, some of them are tagged, some aren't, and they have descriptions on them that you can read and you can control this layout. Um, these columns are, are movable and uh, deletable. So if you don't want your students to see descriptions, um, you don't have to. But if you see here on my server, these are all just in one directory. So it's a flat structure. What BioLucida offers is being able to take that, and if I go down here into my classrooms, I, I in my classrooms, I have these in the IO virtual slide box. First, I renamed it so that I know what school it's from. I have it at the top level broken into histology and then histopathology. If I open up my histology, I have everything organized by, uh, by <clears throat> excuse me, tissue types and organ systems. So if I go into to heart here, 
and I just open up one of my slides. Um, so there are all my, 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 my heart slides in this histology. So I go from this flat thing that's sitting on my server and, and these yellow things usually uh, students never see. I'll, I'll show you an example of that as we start to uh, create users. Um, but this is what you would present to present to your students is, is this hierarchical structure. Um, and so if I look at a heart slide here, I'll open that. Um, I'm gonna open up my macro view, which is a handy tool for an overview of the slide that I always keep up. And I can zoom in um, and then navigate via my macro view. And that's what I'm doing here. And again, this is coming across uh, the East Coast to me. Um, so it, it's, it's really responsive. The other thing we do um, take really care, there, there are a couple things um, in optimization during installation and making sure that your, your experience and your students' experience are, are good ones, um, is we'll make sure that the slides that you're trying to serve are, up, are appropriately uh, formatted. So for instance, um, some of these big slide scanners, they, they really are data machines and they put out these enormous files um, with no zoom structure in them, meaning no, no pre-made uh, magnification levels, um, and they won't have any uh, compression in them. That's, that's all well and good because their job is to get as much data as possible to disk and, and to archive. So to get your slides um, imaged as quickly as possible. What we'll do is go through and make sure that um, when I ask for a region of a slide, it's ready to be served to me uh, nearly instantly. Um, and so that's what I'm doing here. I'm going through with my mouse wheel and zooming through my slide as well as using my macro view to, to move around. I can use my arrow keys uh, to move around and I can, I can drag and drop my slides as well um, with my left, left arrow. So let me close this up. So that's basics of viewing. It has all the, the basic viewing capabilities that you'd expect from a virtual microscopy platform. But this organization of getting the slides into these classrooms in a hierarchical structure is, is something that most schools do. So how do I actually get this to students? Um, so let me take a look here and I'm gonna go to my admin tab, which I only have, I only see that you'll see another view in a second. I only have the admin tab because um, I'm an admin. Uh, most schools will make their instructors administrators and students uh, what we call viewers. And I'll, I'll show that to you now. So if you look here, this server has a lot of users um, relative to what most schools have. Um, and that's because this is one of our, our, our main servers that, uh, that people use uh, throughout the world. Um, but if I wanna add a user, I'm gonna come here and we'll make a new one uh, today called uh, leader. Uh, so that's my username. And I'm just going to, for demonstration purposes, leader healthcare is the last name. Um, it does need an email. We don't use the email for anything other than a unique identifier in the database. Um, and the reasons for that are because when we um, is establishing email often through, uh, if we were doing it just on AWS, it would be easy. Uh, and we do actually have a Sentinel service that watches the server all the time and makes sure that uh, um, slides are being served properly uh, so that you don't have an interruption in, in viewing capabilities for your students. But when we integrate with an IT system, um, usually IT departments don't like things that send out emails from their internal internal workings and that that's perfectly fine. We, we um, I will say Biolicida is built on um, standard web technology, uh, no Java. So, um, it's, it's what's called a WAMP or a LAMP stack. Uh, so we use Apache, uh, uh, MariaDB, as well as PHP infrastructure for implementing BioLucida and then our own custom code on, on top of that and customizations. So we're always up to date with the latest security patches um, as much as anyone can be on the web. So I called my username leader and now I'm gonna give it a password, really an easy one for myself here. Okay, now for students, you're often gonna, um, for, for your educators, you would wanna let them be able to make classrooms and change passwords, but for students, you really will typically set this to no. So you have some control over just what a student can do when they log in. Here, I, I'm not too concerned about that. So 
I'm going to add this. So I've just created my I've just created my my uh, my user called leader. I'm writing that down for myself. And now, how do I how do I, I I make a collection of slides and give that user access? So let's let's run through that. So I'm going to make a, a new a new classroom. So I'll click on create classroom. Um, if you notice, um, I did that on purpose uh, because I wanted to show you that's how you would make a hierarchical one. So if I wanted under heart, I might have vessels, for instance. Um, but if I wanted to make sure that I had a, a, a new root, I'm going to go up to the top, make sure nothing's clicked. And then I'm going to create classroom. And so we'll call this uh, leader, th, leader health. I hit enter. And now if I go there, there's nothing in it. So I haven't populated it with any slides. How do I, how do I actually do that? Let's grab a few slides and move it into that leader, leader health. So here I've got my uh, things from my endocrine system. Maybe I'm gonna pick off my pituitary and a thyroid slide. So I check off the ones I want. And then I'm gonna find my collection or my classroom. And I'm gonna drag my slides to that. And I can see I'm copying to leader health. This is where I'm talking about, you can copy the slides over and over and um, there's no, um, it's not actually duplicating them on the slide, it's making a virtual reference to them. And um, you Nate, can also sorry, use- sorry. Hello, Nate, I'm sorry to cut you over here, but uh, sure. I just wanted to make sure that you have our collections prior to answering most of the questions from our participants. There is a question correlated uh, to what you are doing currently. Um, there's a question from uh, Professor Arun. Is there any description of identification points for each slide? And uh, there are a few more questions, like is it possible to compare images uh, easily? And am I, am I able to focus through 3D virtual, virtual slides? And lastly, uh, what are the viewing capabilities do I have with BioLucida? So I think we have to start with the first question. Is there any description of identification points for each slide? Yeah, there is. So you can actually put in case notes on each slide. So what I just did here was to move, not move, I copied a couple of slides into that new uh, collection of slides. Uh, so let's look at those. Um, first up, there's this description field. Um, and that, that's telling me that I have histology, human endocrine system, uh, pituitary, and it's, it's normal. Um, if I open this, so I'll open this slide. One thing I didn't show is there's this information button. And if I detach that, uh, here's a lot more information. And this description and notes field um, can have as much as much or as little information in it as I want because I could I could click edit if I had the permission I could click edit on this and put in as many as many notes as I wanted to on this so so yes definitely um, you can you can put um, information um, from case notes or descriptions or you can blank it out if it's if it's an exam like I was saying um, so the yeah that's a definite yes I hope that answers that question. Uh, yes, it answers the question. And also, Nate, I believe it's uh, it's time to uh, share as well those comparison between images, histology and histopath uh, sample slides. Uh, there's a question here. Is it possible to compare images easily? And, I'm, and am I able to focus through the 3D virtual slides? Yeah, so let me go really quick to, um, I hadn't gotten to this yet, but this is pretty, um, this should be pretty straightforward. This list is, um, I haven't, well, how, if, if I wanna to go to a particular area of a slide and I wanna be able to go to that particular area, maybe this, this boundary between connective tissue and, and my other tissue. Um, and I would like to revisit that over and over. Um, and I'll, I'll just call this boundary and have students go to that. Um, you see here, I made a bookmark. That's what this list is. This list is, I can go through and um, give point a student to any one of these with the share button. And if I click through, you'll start to see I'm going to specific content. So I can really give them, I can give them, of course, my list of slides um, and make sure that they have permission to that. Or I can give them a really guided list. And one of these that I happen to have 
Um, if I look here, um, that's microscopic and gross. And one of these, I have a cyto slide, and I'm just going to show that. Um, get there quick. Sorry about that. I just have to find that really quickly. Well, the other thing that I can actually do, oh, here's some college. So here's a here's a a, a slide from um, that a blood the blood specimen, and if I look here, um, let's maybe find something up here. Um, I'm I have a slider that I can I can move to focus through, but I can also use my page up and page down. So there's a, a three dimensional cytology slide that um, that I I can focus through just like I'm at the microscope, and I can grab my slider as well. Yeah, so if I do have specimens like that, and like I did mention, we have a couple of um, neuroanatomy departments where they, they cut things more thickly. So they actually scan in, in 3D and then um, serve that to the students that way. Um, that was that question. Was there another one that I missed? Oh, comparing images, was it? Yes, how to compare the images. Yep, let's take a look at that. Um, so I first have to find some things that are, are comparable. Let's, um, let me open up my histopathology here. Uh, blood vessels and lymphatics. Let me look at atherosclerosis. So I'm gonna open that slide and then I can go back to my, I'll go back to my histology and I'll look at At these. these are two slides that were, were done together, but if I wanted to compare these two slides together uh, for, for um, histology versus histopathology, I can click on the this square um, and I'm gonna move my browser off to the side here. And so in here, I can, I can zoom in independently on each one. And I always know my microns because I've got my bar down here at the bottom of each image. So I can tell what, what kind of, um, magnification on that, um, or I can, I can lock these two. It doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to particularly lock these two images because they're not alternating sections, but I certainly can do that so that when I, when I zoom or move, I stay at the same magnification in both slides. Um, so that, that certainly is a way that people use this to compare um, uh, healthy versus non-healthy tissue. Uh, hopefully that answers that question. Okay, if, if it does, I'll, I'll keep moving on. So when I left off here, I had uh, opened a, um, I had, I had created a collection of slides that we called, oops, Global Health. And I put some slides in it. Or Leader Health, sorry about that. Uh, and I put two slides in it. I can grab slides from anywhere else and drag them in. It's, it's as simple as, as drag and drop. But how do I give that account that I made, um, which we called a leader, how do I give that student access to this? And how do I log in? And those are two kind of fundamental things I, I was just going to cover. Um, as an administrator or as a, as a teacher, I can click on edit current classroom. And I have this, this list of things that I can do um, with this particular collection of slides. So all the permissions and how things happen tend to be, um, tend to, um, be at the level of your slide collections or classrooms. Here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look and find um, that student that I made, that student account out of my list. And there they are, leader. And then I'm gonna decide what type of um, permission I give them. I will note that if I had my, my users all grouped into groups, I could also add entire groups of people to have permission to see my collections of slide here. We'll um, give them view permission. There are two other permissions um, that are, 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 one is relevant, one is not. Uh, the other is download. Um, so 
view permission, the first one, which you usually will give a student, um, the student can view, zoom, pan, open um, their images, um, but they can't do things like delete them or rename them or tag them. Um, download is the same type of permission, except that they can actually download the slide. So if you had another collaborator or another school and you wanted to have them uh, locally have the slide, this gets used in research more than education, but um, there's ability. And then maintainer is, if I made this leader healthcare, this student account a maintainer, they would have the ability to um, uh, delete, annotate, move, uh, rename slides and rearrange them in the collection. Um, why, why would you do that? Well, you can imagine if you had a, an educator and they weren't an admin in the system, uh, but you wanted them to be able to create content, uh, you would make them a maintainer on a slide collection so that they could go in and, and alter things. But here, I just wanna give them view permission um, and I'm gonna click on save. So now that account um, has permission to see um, a couple of things. One, anything that I made public, uh, one thing I didn't show here is you can make it so that um, the privacy of this collection, I have it set to private so that only the people in the list and any admins um, are allowed to see that collection of slides. You can also make it completely public so that anyone who has the server URL can see those slides. Uh, the Iowa collection is a good example of that at biolucida.net. Or you can make it so that, hey, you at least have to have um, an account on the server. You can't, it's not public, but anyone who has an account on the server can see this collection of slides. So here I, I added our leader and now let's see what that, that particular uh, person can see. So I'm gonna go to connections and you'll see, like I, I say, usually a, an educator or students will have one, one or two in this list. I have so many just because, um, because I am the product manager and work with so many different schools on this. Um, two ways to connect. Um, one actually uses the URL, a username and a password and the other uses a nine digit code. You can see how I connected with the, my nine digit codes here. It's called use a quick code and the student will type in nine digits and they're automatically in. The other way to do that um, and which I'll do here um, is I'm gonna give it a name and this is the name that appears in the list. Um, so this we'll call a leader health and that's just the name that appears here. The, the URL here happens to be biolucida.net. The username was leader and my password twice. Save, and now I wanna connect as that user. And when I do that, you can see the yellow folders go away, the direct server goes away, and I only, I only have permission to view things that are either public, like the Iowa virtual slide box, or the one that I've been given, I've been given permission to see, my leader health. So here I am, I'm logged on as a student, um, I'm, I'm viewing my slides. If you notice, I bring up the information. There's no edit button because I, I'm, my permission is such that I'm really just allowed to view the slides that I've been given permission to see. Um, are there any other questions, uh, Federico, before I move on? Uh, yes, Nate, there are a few more questions um, coming Great. from Professor uh, Amina. After scanning the slides using virtual microscopes, say for example, a perio, how do we upload the slides into BioLucida, and what is what for, um, and what is what it format uh, the picture should be? That's a Same that's a great for an, an anonymous um, anonymous uh, attendee as well. So how do they combine with the slide organization system in the scanner? So they, they touch based on a perio and Alexis, which has its own. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that's a really great practical question. And it kind of gets to what I was talking about earlier about making sure that the formats are amenable to being uh, served over the web. Um, and that is one of the most important parts of the process. So we work with the formats from all major slide manufacturers. Um, and in an educational setting, what we'll tend to do, um, SVS slides are almost always good to go because they are they're effectively a TIFF file with a pyramidal structure often inside of them using compression. So um, they have their, they have all the magnification levels in the file already. Uh, they're compressed. So they're, they're, 
very often optimized and ready to go. And they're, they're actually the slide format we've worked with the longest uh, because the Imperial scanner has been around uh, for quite a while. Um, the, other, the other formats, um, like um, for instance, Olympus's VSI, Leica's SCN, I'm trying to think of some of the others. Others are just plain TIFFs that people put out. Um, what we'll do is we'll check and make sure that installation time um, those slides have um, the appropriate, um, mostly zoom levels and compression. Uh, if they don't, we'll convert them as they go up to the server. And how to get things to the server, there's a couple ways. One, you can, if you have appropriate permission, again, you can upload. And so I would upload files here. I, I, won't, I won't show that now um, because it could take time given my internet connection, but you would grab a group of slides and then you would, literally just click upload. You would choose where you want them to go. You could make a new position for them. And where they show up is are in the server view in the, in the, um, in the track directory. So for instance, this user Lang uh, uploaded three uh, JPEG 2000 files. Um, and um, he did that via that facility. The other way to do it, um, and this is, this is definitely uh, more on the IT side. We'll usually work during installation to make sure that um, it, um, with the IT to make sure that we're getting the slides in properly um, is this thing called file tracker. And if you look here, here are all the, the, the spaces on the server, all these different uh, mounts that are on this particular server where I had slides and they were put on the server. And then what we do is we tell BioLucida Hey, make me um, make me a, a a a track directory or my my yellow folder um, that points at where I know my slides are on the server. So you can upload things, or you can do it this way, which is more of a direct um, um, right on the server, and that's usually done at installation time. So those are two ways to get things on. Um, and touching a little bit on the file formats, uh, was there more on that, Federico? Yep. Yeah, very few more questions from Dr. Uh, Hussam Usman. So is the system contains some slides of immunohistochemistry uh, and slides which is which are stained with the fish technique. I think it's a fish technique um, like the fluorescence um, yep. hybridization. It does. Um, this is actually uh, an immuno slide of a brain section. Um, what was this particular one stained with? I, I'm not quite sure, probably some expression vector that um, is meant to identify things in the cortical and uh, in, in, in lower connected areas. Um, but yeah, the biolucid doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't matter to biolucid whether it's, it's fluorescent or whether it's, it's bright field data, it, it will display both. Uh, the only difference with fluorescence is I have these two channels, that, oops, I have these two channels that I'm looking at that I can turn on and off. Right, and I, and I can control the brightness, contrast, and gamma. Um, so yeah, it definitely supports fluorescent data as, as well. Um, usually um, in education, um, um, we don't bump into that much, but sometimes uh, PATH folks will have cases that they've done immunofluorescence on and, and or fish. Any other questions? Yeah, just uh, how do you monitor the quality of the slides? Or sorry, the quality control of the slides. Oh, um, is that is that um, just to, to dig in on that a little bit? Is that does that have to do with um, the? Um, is that a question about compression? Because um, one of the things that we do um, to to do that compression, um, we'll use a, a, a non lossy JPEG two thousand compression. Um, and the other thing we'll do, sometimes we'll use a five or 10X lossy compression. Um, and we have um, quantitative data that, and qualitative data from a pathologists who couldn't tell the difference between um, grading uh, specimens that were compressed with lossy or non-lossy compression. Um, so we, we have quality control that. The other thing I've done in the research realm is I've taken data that's compressed with JPEG 2000 and said, um, do quantitative measures like um, dendritic spine 
for instance, dendritic spine length and extent or um, the extent of um, a population of cells in uh, say a cor specific cortical or, or thalamic region, um, do they change upon compression? And the answer is no. And in fact, um, we compress at five to 10. Um, and for those quantitative measures in fluorescence, uh, we can actually go up to 20 or 30 without seeing any statistical difference in measures we make on the images. Hopefully that answers the, that, that question. Do you have any others, Federico? Uh, yeah, so just um, these two are more of the implementation part and like sure. which computer platform do you support and what are the viewing capabilities do I have with BioLucida? <laughs> Yeah, that's those are, are really great practical questions. I was I was coming to them, so it's 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 perfect. Um, I the servers that we run on, of course, I mentioned. Let me let me pull this up here. AWS. Um, we don't really um, we're, we're we're relatively um, agnostic. We use AWS because it's the most popular one and, and easiest and has the most sites. Um, but as I said, you can be on campus either. Um, and these are the options. And we don't make we don't make you go through this. This is something that we can figure. You can see there's a lot of lot of configuration to setting up these servers, but it can be Linux or Windows. So that's the starter, right? It can run on a Windows or Linux platform. The viewer that I'm showing you can run on a Mac or a PC. Um, it also um, and this is this is how we pick what server we would show you. So typically, um, I would pick um, this particular server, what's called a C5X large at Amazon. Um, and that's more than sufficient for, for, um, for serving slides that are even hundreds of thousands by hundreds of thousands of pixels. If it were 3D, I would probably go up to an, an M5 extra large or just something a little beefier um, like that. Um, and you can see the associated on-demand cost difference. Um, but yeah, so we'll configure that or your IT will configure either a Windows or a Linux server um, and the, on the client side, it's, it's Windows or Mac or in any uh, browser. So here's, and I was getting to this, but here's BioLucida in, um, in Chrome. Um, and I have my macro view. Um, and I'm just, I'm kind of moving around this particular image to this, uh, some of the, the various tissues I have here. Um, and here are my, my slide collection. But what you can do is, is share this so that you can embed this via URL, an embedded object, or an iframe, and put that in your learning management platform so that you can have students in Blackboard, for instance, uh, viewing slides, um, virtual slides during an exam. And we have schools who do, who do that. So um, I, I hope that answers that question. Um, and specs on these servers, um, like I said, are usually four cores and six or eight gigs of RAM. So we have a relatively small footprint and that's really due to how we've optimized the, the way we put images up there, but also the way that we serve that, that's what BioLucida does is it really efficiently sort, serves packets of images on demand in a, in, in a big parallel way. Thank you for answering the questions, Nate. Um, yeah. There's another question from Professor Ahmed uh, Yagi. He's asking how about uh, building 3D from serial sections and what about different stains? That is a, that's a great question. Um, uh, that's, a, that's, that's um, something we touch on in, in the, um, the research realm quite a bit. Um, and specifically, there, there are two places we do that. I'll show that. Um, one is BrainMaker. So if you look here at this little image, um, and it doesn't have to, we have a thing called Tissue Maker too, and it's the exact same thing as BrainMaker. Um, it's just branded differently. And it specifically is for taking um, serial sections, lining them up and making full resolution volumes from them. Um, and I can show you some examples of that. If I go to really quick, I have a database of over uh, 200 mouse brains as part of uh, a project called the GenSat project. And this is in collaboration with uh, Dr. Chip Gerfin down at the National Institutes of Mental Health here in the US. Um, and so I have all these brains in here. And if I look at just some of these, um, and let's look at this. This is a rabies, in, it, rabies injection uh, viral vector. Um, but these are all relatively high resolution brains. They're at 10X. Um, and they are, they have all been assembled from um, 
from um, whole slide images of the of the the mouse coronal sections. And here they're all registered to each other. Um, but I could what we what we tend to do is we'll go in and for specific subpopulations of neurons, um, we'll go in and count using machine learning the number of cells. And we know because uh, we can map to the Allen Atlas, or in, in the case of rat, we can match, uh, map to the uh, Waxholm at Atlas. Um, and we'll be able to give a readout of how many cells throughout the entire brain are in every brain region. Um, so yeah, that I, I didn't expect that question today, but that's really awesome. That's one of the other things I do at, at, at um, MBF is um, I head up our research for um, uh, the neuroanatomy uh, part of it. And this is a big part of that project. So um, yes, we can line up serial sections, whether it's from a biopsy in Brightfield or whether it's uh, you know fluorescent sections of tissue like this. Are there any other questions, Federico? Uh, so far, Neith, and uh, no, no more questions from. Okay, so let's let's jump back to um, one of the other things I just wanted to show you. That's a really uh, simple thing. Um, so we'll go back to that collection that we made. Uh, what do we call that? Leader health. There we are. And let's go into our thyroid slide. And we can make some. Let's make some annotations. So for annotations, I'm going to click on this hand with a pencil. Like I said, if you can draw in um, in PowerPoint, you can pretty much um, draw in 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 Biolucida. There are um, some some um, differences, and I'll, I'll just show those really quick. Um, so I've drawn an arrow there. I can change its color to make it anything I you know I, I choose. Um, I can also say, how do I want to show this? Do I want to have it showing when I when I have the student call it up? Do I want it to look like this, or do I want to put, you know, just just around my annotation? Most people will do custom view, and I set current as custom, and I'm just going to give it an, a, a really quick name here, arrow one, um, and I'll save this. Um, the, oh, the other thing that you can do with this is you can choose whether that arrow always shows up or whether it's only shows up when you get to that zoom level or whether it's a zoom above, at and below the zoom level that you're at. So let's let's make it around the placement level and I'll save. Um, and then I'm gonna go somewhere else in my slide. And I'm gonna make a, we, I guess we can make a, a, a circle, a box here is fine. Um, and I'm gonna change the color of that just to show how that works. Um, I can also, um, I can fill the interior of this um, if I wanted to. That helps in, in that helps in H and E slides where if I put text down um, and I wanna be able to see it, I can have it on a white background. But most people just leave the opacity so it's see-through. Um, I'm gonna make this one so it always shows up. And I'm going to just simply call it box. This text that I'm entering can be literally anything you want. Some folks have it really, really uh, long. Um, others just have very, very simple things. And that, that really is up to how you create your content for your students. Um, but if I save this, so now you'll see I have two on my list. Um, and if I'm just panning and zooming, see my, my arrow is gone, but that box is always there because I told it to always stick around. Um, but what I can do is I can I can just double click that and go um, double click this one and it brings me to those particular regions. If you notice, this zoomed in on that square because I told it um, that the the zoom level or I used um, best fit view, so it, it fit the annotation. So here I'm going to set this to current and then we'll save it again. Um, so now when I go back and forth between these, I get the view that I that I that I wanted in the first place. Um, I, I show all of that just so you can really you can have more than one annotation in a group too. You could have a box and an arrow in this in the same uh, clickable set. What this does is that when the student is in here and they open up the slide that you want them to open, 
they automatically have this annotation window open if there are annotations there and they can click through and go to specific features that you want them to see. Um, so that's that's really annotations. Um, it, it's it's that it's that straightforward to use them. There are more advanced things you can do with them. For instance, I could make this annotation. Uh, if I click on it, I could put a URL in there so that it goes to uh, some some resource that I want this to. Whether it's a lab manual on the web or whether it's a Wikipedia page on some molecular process that's in, that's in the tissue type. Um, I have the ability to uh, to put in uh, web links in there too. So all the annotations can have um, it can have really rich content within them, across them. Um, I can have them set up too so that um, they're they're default. Um, they default so that they don't show up by default, and the student has to do a uh, has to do a bit of a hide and seek to find them. Um, and then I can control the um, I can control the uh, visibility of those, um, but that's really so. We've gone through creating a user, um, and I, I'll make a note on that in a second too. Creating a, a small collection of slides to um, enriching that a bit by looking at the image information you can put on, as well as any um, drawings um, that you would like to put on them. A real specific thing um, I'll talk about with respect to implementation that's important to consider is, is how you wanna manage the users for students. So if we looked, if I go back here to my, my users, um, I have this list of users. Most schools, what they'll do is they'll make that account like I did earlier and they'll have it such that um, you, use that same account for each medical class. Um, so you'll have like med, med class 2024, uh, for instance, and they'll all use it. And that's one of the reasons you'll set it so that none of the students can change the, the password. Um, other schools, uh, and this is in the minority, um, will, uh, will connect to their active directory, part of the active directory, and actually they can use their campus-wide login. That's less um, common uh, for one simple reason is that it just makes a lot of users and then they have to be managed. You can put them into user groups, but someone has to do that at the onset. And so it's it's kind of an upfront uh, effort as opposed to just giving the class, you know, in their lab manual spelling out, these are the directions on how you connect. Here's the username that you're gonna use for this. So really today I've gone through, um, we talked a lot about slides and formats, how to get them up to the system, how the system can exist, um, as well as um, you know the basics of making, making uh, some of this content. Um, that was really everything I had wanted to get through. And um, in our hour time, we've got time for questions. More Federico, I'm glad you you yeah. you stopped me in the as we went along. That was that was awesome. Yes, yes, yes. It's important. Uh, Nate, there are two more questions from the chat box uh, from Professor Durjoy. They're asking if what about uh, during live annotations for lectures and resources uh, during live sessions. So can you just quickly uh, show the annotation parts uh, for for live sessions? Oh, so as in when you're in front of the student. So no, as so you, I believe as when you, it's being shared uh, online. Oh, so what happens is, so you, you saw me drawing. These are, anytime I make a drawing, those are those are saved on the server. So whenever the student opens up, um, uh, let's see, where were we in the thyroid here? Whenever the student opens that slide, after I've made, they have access to these. Um, if they have permission to see the slide, they, they ought, any annotations that you've made are saved to the server and then they'll suddenly see them in this box and they can click through. Does that make sense? If you're doing it live, the students out there might have to click refresh. Let's say I'm on my computer and I'm drawing on an overhead projector and I want the students to have that on their laptops or on their workstations. Um, I would draw them like I did and save them. Uh, but then the students might have to click refresh. Just They will auto-populate, um, um, but if you want it immediately them to have that in the list, um, they would click on refresh and then they would, they would see that that actually downloads from the server. But yeah, any drawings you make, um, are um, saved up to the server and are accessible by the students if you've given them permission to see those slides. 
Okay, thank you so much, Nate. Uh, there are a few more questions, again, with implementations from um, Professor Anastasia. So uh, she's asking, how does the subscription to the system work? Is it a uh, yearly or, or one time? And also uh, any options to use the slides for tests? So um, she's maybe after the webinar, we can you know uh, provide them uh, a sample, an access to, the, to our existing servers, maybe for a, a month, uh, something like this, just for them to try it out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's a couple things that we can do here. One is um, I can give you access to this server, um, and and you can distribute a um, a username and password and instructions on how to get on. Um, and then the other one is I can give you access to the one that's in the EU. And let me show you that really quickly. Um, It has a smaller set of slides. It has just a subset of the histoly, uh, Iowa collection, uh, but it might be faster. Um, and here's a really, um, a really practical point. Um, so one of the things we bump into and help schools with a lot is uh, making sure that um, their infrastructure is appropriate. So every time I move in one of these images, and this is coming from Germany now, Every time I move around in one of these images, about four to seven megabytes is being pushed off the server to its, its, its network interface card out to the wilds of the internet and then down to my client. Um, and so as I move around here, this is me from the US contacting my German server. Um, that's about four to seven megabytes with each click. So if you can imagine you've got a hundred students in a room hitting all those, one of the most important things is to make sure your access points are, are, aren't getting saturated. Uh, and, and will help at install time just by going over the specs with IT folk, um, just to make sure that that's, that's all appropriate. It's usually, it, usually modern schools um, are, are pretty, pretty set to go. Uh, and I know you're, you're very wired up. So um, um, it's not really, uh, I, I wouldn't anticipate a, a problem with that. Um, <clears throat> but that is, um, that is one kind of implementation uh, aspect uh, to consider that really practically what we'll do is, you know, oftentimes students from home will be on a neighbor's Wi-Fi and they'll have movies streaming and, 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 and music streaming. So one really important thing is under this account tab, I can run a bandwidth test and that's from my client to the particular server that I'm, I'm, I'm connected to at any given time. And I'm connected to this German server at about 13 megabits per second, somewhere between 13 and 20. 10 and 20, you always want this number to be above five. If it's below five, almost always the, um, that's anytime we get a report of lag from a particular student, we'll tell them, make sure you have all your streaming stuff off um, and then run this band test, bandwidth test. And if it's below five, um, it, it, you, know, you need a, a, a faster connection. So that's, that's a rough guideline. So I'd encourage you when you, when you try things out, um, Test this. It's just under account and then bandwidth test and uh, see what your see what your value comes out to be. If I hit this one in the U.S. really quickly, yeah, that's going to be a little bit faster. But those both of those speeds are are, are more than acceptable. Um, so, anything else? I know we're getting close on time. Oh, you're muted, Federico. Federico, you're, you're actually muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. So just yeah. one more question from Professor Ahmed asking, like, what service can you provide should one uh, need special train or immunohistochemistry uh, or else related to microanatomy education? Um, could you repeat the first part of this? Oh, what service can you provide should one need a special strain or immunohistochemistry or else uh, related to uh, microanatomy education? Yep. We do have, um, we have laboratory services, but they're uh, more endpoint services. So they're not wet services. We don't, we don't typically do cutting or staining. Uh, we do all the imaging part of things um, and would get that back to you. Um, folks um, who we work with, there are a couple of, of, of places who, who we work with in the, in the States um, when we do the kind of um, contract research, which we have an arm of our company does that. 
Um, and that um, those folks are neuroscience associates um, because we're so, our research is so neuro uh, uh, focused. And the other one is um, F, um, um, I don't work with them as much, but they're, they're definitely the fluorescence end of things. They're FD Neurotech, it's called. Um, so yeah, we, we work with out of house things for that. Um, but we'll, certainly we can image any of those, any of the, the glass that you have and make uh, virtual copies of them for you. And great, yes. So um, I, I believe if you have, if uh, there are any more questions, we are, uh, we were having like an, uh, two more minutes to answer those, those um, questions from your end. And then just before we, um, just before Nate's answered that, I just like, I just would like to show you some, Oh, okay, just a second. Can you enable this? Can you share it, please? Okay, let's talk. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, so Nate, could you just please uh, stop sharing your screen if you don't Oh, mind. yeah, you bet, you bet. So I'm just uh, wanted to show some um, some comments, uh, feedback. Sorry, feedbacks from from the MBF BioLucida uh, uh, solution. So there's uh, from Professor Marco Kostovsky in Macedonia, saying that BioLucida is an amazing platform for using virtual histology in medical education that I have been using to aid my teaching practices for years. And the medical students have also shown great interest in the virtual slides, and that has been helped helping them to achieve better results and then finding like findings that I have also to publish because uh, like Nate, there's an, another uh, another solutions, right? That the research edition of, of BioLucida. So there are two editions. One is the medical education edition and one is the uh, research edition. So, and of course, uh, if you do not have uh, any more questions, you can always uh, reach out to us to simulations at Leader Healthcare Group, or you can key in your, uh, or you can you can contact me directly from uh, my email addresses, fhenobili at uh, leaderhealthcaregroup.com. Great. Uh, yeah, Nate, there's another another question from Professor uh, Dorjoy saying that how may BioLisida assist in accessing other image libraries? So online image libraries, um, typically BioLucida will, will you'll, you would either upload images to a BioLucida server or you would point it at another, um, at a partition or file share that contains slides. Um, you certainly, so most people, so an example of this is when people have gross anatomy and they're, they're basically photos. Um, if I wanted to include those in my BioLucida collection, I would, I would usually just download them or screenshot them and then upload that to BioLucida. That's, that's the most common way that that gets done. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nate, for your time. I know that yeah, uh, you. there's still more questions to come, but uh, definitely we will touch base with, the, with those who have registered through our webinar link. You will be receiving an access as well from us so that uh, you can uh, try it out for maybe a, a month's time. And then after this webinar, the, the, the recorded presentation will be shared as well to you. So again, I'd like to uh, end this uh, webinar with a quote from World Health Organization that learning together to work together for health, for a better health to each and everybody. So again, um, Nate, thank you so much for your time. It's too early in the US and uh, for, for gracing us uh, this afternoon. Yeah, it's, it's actually snowing here, so I'm glad to be inside. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank, you, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for today's webinar. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you.